Welcome everyone to today's program, Fortifying the Future, Building Resilience in the Age of Disinformation. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Susan Elliott, President and CEO of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. And we're very pleased today to have assembled a distinguished group of experts to speak about this important topic. You know, while social media channels and new technologies have rightfully been lauded for their ability to foster community and bridge global divides, they sometimes can and do create challenges when weaponized by nefarious actors. So what we want to do is look at the long-term and deeply embedded relationships within NATO and transatlantic relations more broadly, and try to focus on how we can use the material that the Alliance has uh, collectively put together to build resilience and to fortify against future hostile information threats. So the National Committee on American Foreign Policy has put together a two-part series, and today is the first event, and we will focus on U.S. policy and how the private and public sectors can work in tandem to reduce uh, credible threats. Our second event will be held next Monday, uh, December 6th, one week from today, and in that program, we will focus more on European perspectives and how national level policy works in concert with multilateral decision making in countering the threat of hostile information. So we have very little time today, so I'm going to go straight to just some brief introductions of our distinguished panel. And I'll start with Kevin Allison, who is a director in the Eurasia Group's uh, geotechnical practice. He works at the intersection of technology, technology and geopolitics, and he focuses on how technology is fueling political disruption around the world, from nation state competition around 5G networks, artificial intelligence, and other emerging technologies to the spread of misinformation and new threats in cyberspace. And he helps Eurasia Group's clients understand how these trends are shaping relationships between governments companies and non-state actors and how government responses to these pressures can affect regulation and technology policy. We also have Gordon uh, Skip Davis, who has served as NATO's Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Defense Investment. He previously served as the Director of Operations at the US European Command in Stuttgart, Germany, where I worked for him with him. And um, he's a great colleague and friend. Before he retired from the US Army, he had more than 37 years of distinguished service uh, serving our government. And he's currently a senior fellow with the Center for European Policy Analysis. And we also have Clara Tsao, who is a national security and disinformation expert and technology entrepreneur who serves as the co-founder and is on the board of Trust and Safety Professional Association and the Trust and Safety Foundation. She previously was a senior advisor for emerging technology at the Department of Homeland Security and chief technology officer of two US government task forces focused on countering foreign influence, election security, and homegrown extremism. And the moderator of today's discussion is, this, is Nick Thompson, the CEO of The Atlantic, who previously served as editor-in-chief of Wired Magazine. He's held many numerous um, educational, um, excuse me, not educational, he does uh, educate, but editorial positions across the media landscape, often engaging with stories involving technology, politics, and the law. He's the author of The Hawk and Dove, Paul Nietzsche, and George Kenyon, and the History of the Cold War. And he currently serves, and we're very proud of this, as a trustee on the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. And before I turn the discussion over to Nick, I want to thank NATO's Public Diplomacy Division for their support of the National Committee's series on this important topic. And just a few ground rules. This uh, discussion is on the record. We will be recording it and it will be available later on our uh, NCAAP YouTube channel. Um, if you would like to ask a question, look at the bottom of your screen. I think everyone's familiar now with how to type in in the Q&A and um, both Nick and uh, the NCFP staff and myself will, um, when we get to a point where we're ready to take questions from the audience, we'll address your questions. So thanks again to everyone for being here and I'll turn the discussion over to Nick. Great. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you for welcoming us here. This will be fabulous. So General Davis, let's start with you. This panel is supported by NATO. How big a threat is disinformation to NATO and the countries in NATO? Is it a mortal threat? Is it a slight threat? 
basically how screwed is our sponsor. Okay, well, that's a great uh, place to start with since the U.S. is a very key ally in this uh, alliance of 30. But uh, with respect to uh, disinformation, talk about threat. Let's talk about the scope of that yeah. threat. I think it, uh, you talked a little about the nuisance and moral, mortal threat, et cetera. I think it runs the gamut. Uh, more importantly, I, I think it's, it's important to put it in context in terms of dis disinformation has been around for centuries. NATO as an institution has been dealing with uh, disinformation since its, its, uh, its birth, you know, 72 years ago. Uh, and so the old methods that consist, uh, con continue to persist, I should say, but there uh, are a whole bunch of new uh, technologies, uh, the access information, the democratization of information writ large, the ability to access and disseminate have vastly improved. And so I'd say the scale, the reach, the speed, the sophistication uh, of uh, disinformation has all increased. Uh, and uh, disinformation, if you want to define it, and I think NATO has actually defined it as the deliberate uh, intent to spread misinformation or false information. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, it's seen as, as a threat in many different types of forms for different actors, foreign, domestic, state, and, and non-state uh, sponsored uh, uh, support of uh, disinformation. But uh, more importantly, it's, it's how is it influencing uh, behavior or even political decisions, in some cases, real operations. Uh, and that's where you get to you know, the risk of the impact that you, you mentioned up front. So I think that first off, uh, because the risk can be severe in terms of the impact on uh, decision-making at the highest level or public uh, decisions made that change governments, et cetera, and establish policy. I think of Brexit, think of other things, presidential elections, et cetera, prime ministers, et cetera. So um, it can have an incre incredible impact. Nations can't uh, avoid not responding. They need to organize as a result of uh, what, uh, what, can, what disinformation can do. And so I think that's the most important thing. Is that, uh, you can't leave it unchallenged. Uh, nations need to organize their ability to assess, identify, uh, respond individually, collectively, uh, in conjunction with private and public sector, individuals, civil society, et cetera, uh, in order to, uh, I would say, stem the potential negative influence of this information. That makes a lot of sense. And that is an excellent framework. Claire, why don't we go to you? And let me ask you, as Skip has described it, it's a major issue, it's influenced lots of events. Explain what is new, what has changed in your analysis in the last couple of years, the last couple of months, the last couple of weeks. And that's interesting about the way disinformation works, because as Skip said, it's been around forever. What is what is different now and how is it changing? Yeah, no, absolutely. So I, um, I co-founded a few years ago, the Trust and Safety Professional Association, the Trust and Safety Foundation. And what has changed a lot is a lot of companies today are recognizing that disinformation, misinformation, all these issues are so real that there needs to be experts from their side to tackle these issues. And trust and safety teams have been around since the early days of eBay. Like, like Skip had said, this is not a brand new problem. Um, during eBay days, people are determining what is a fake and real product purse and the liability of those kind of platforms. And today, every company you can imagine in the technology sector deals with uh, disinformation, misinformation in some way, even dating applications where um, people are going online and then meeting in real life, particularly strangers that could be catfished. You have people committing suicide on platforms like Robinhood if they trade a lot of stock, right? And then there's also other issues where I think a lot of uh, people today in this panel are thinking about where it might disrupt elections that might uh, shift the outcome of citizens being able to participate in a knowing democracy. It might cause ISIS, uh, former ISIS recruits right online who believe in a certain ideology to fly thousands of miles from the US, Canada, from Europe to, to join an invisible war. So there is so much, um, there is nothing necessarily new about it, but today the internet and social media has amplified the reach of the way people can access this information. It's created a number of echo chambers. There's more and more private messaging servers where information can quickly get spread without anyone being able to do much about it. And so um, what has been interesting is definitely seeing more and more companies trying to think about trust and safety um, 
in, in the forefront of the way they build their business as opposed to something that is an afterthought. And I think that's been very positive change because it used to be that it took a number of activism and media uh, for companies to say, I'm finally going to put a bandaid on this issue and do something about it. So um, that's definitely one thing that I think has been has been interesting. I think second is there's more recognition on the public, the understanding what disinformation is. Uh, I started off my uh, career actually at a very large company called Microsoft, you may have heard of it, but I worked on a partnership in Myanmar back in 2013, 2014, where we were trying to build digital literacy uh, during the time when Myanmar was going through its first democratic election. And when people think about election security being a scary thing in 2016, it has happened in other countries around the world. We just don't notice it until it hits Western democracy. It takes that moment when people feel like it is you know, in their backyard, in their home, that they start doing something about it. Um, in September 11th, 2014, there was something called the Columbia chemical plant explosion, where there were um, text messages and news sent to local residents um, and amplified on social media about this chemical plant exploding. And that might be on the surface, um, kind of strange. Why, why would we care about a chemical plant? Well, that actually was um, the Russian IRA at the time experimenting how America was responding to local news outlets. And that might not necessarily been a threat to democracy, but it takes these small pieces built up over time together um, alongside um, a number of other issues that people in the US are just frustrated about or in other countries, they wanna see news, they want to see information that really um, adheres to the way that they see the world. And the internet is just a melting ground of all that information where if you want to believe in a conspiracy theory, you will find that online community. So um, like I said, this is not a new issue. I think what has happened is there's more and more people online today. There's more and more trust and safety teams. And there's more kinds of problems that nobody has um, faced before. We've seen this huge explosion right now in Web3 and the blockchain community where there's even more security. Um, there's now finances involved a lot more um, in, in, in this ecosystem and there's more decentralization. So um, this, this issue will continue to persist and we need the smartest people to tackle this issue like everyone here in this room. Wonderful. I mean, I'm going to ask you whether the blockchain can be helpful or harmful uh, later on in a second. But uh, Kevin, I want to go to a, a question to you i was listening to a panel that you did on disinformation not long ago and you made a very astute and interesting point saying that disinformation works quite differently in the united states from in india will you explain what is distinct about the way disinformation works here versus other countries and why that might be well i think it's important to think about a disinformation economy which has both a supply of disinformation uh, supplied by various actors uh, and also demand for misinformation um, on, on the part of, of consumers of information. Uh, I, I think that that in the U.S., one of the interesting points that I think we saw between the 2016 U.S. election uh, and the 2020 U.S. election was, was this idea that uh, in, in 2016, the headlines were dominated by foreign actors, uh, malicious foreign actors kind of using organized algorithmic kind of disinformation, ad targeting and so on to reach very niche audiences. And what you had in 2020 was, was actually, uh, I think I characterized it as a lot of the disinformation was coming from inside the house. There were domestic actors, uh, various types, you know, some financially motivated, some politically motivated, uh, embracing, amplifying, spreading that disinformation, uh, including from, from parts of the very top of the political system. Uh, and, and I felt that that was a, a shift. It kind of underscored for me the extent to which I think there's a, a growing realization. I think that experts in the community who've worked on disinformation for a long time have for a long time argued that we have a kind of whole of society challenge here that's going to require efforts by both companies, uh, politicians, civil society, and, and individual consumers of information to kind of work work against this, this trend that's being able, enabled by new technology. Um, I think in, in, in India, um, you have a kind of uh, a case where you have a, a billion people, you have different platforms, um, you have uh, not only politically motivated disinformation, but, but disinformation that's, that's being used by individual communities to incite ethnic violence. You have the use of encrypted messengers uh, to, to kind of incite mob lynchings and, and mob violence against particular communities. 
Uh, and I think that especially when you think about the biggest internet platforms, which I, I don't think there's any real way of solving this without them. You know, we have to acknowledge that that these big internet platforms, I think, are here. Uh, they they have to be part of the solution. Uh, it can't just be imposed by government on the from the outside. It's going to involve working closely with these companies to, to try to fix this. Uh, they have a, a really difficult set of challenges when you think about that spectrum of kind of disinformation undermining confidence in the democratic political system all the way to the spectrum of, of, of disinformation that's inciting violence against individuals and individual communities. Um, and I think that we're still early in the process. I think we've gone through a couple of learning cycles on this, as Clara kind of alluded to. Society has a chance to kind of measure, adjust, adapt, uh, and the bad actors also have a chance to measure, adjust, and adapt. But I think this is going to be a, a kind of long-term problem. Uh, I'm, I'm also much more on the spectrum uh, of a sort of nuisance to existential threat. I think I'm somewhere closer to the uh, a major threat to the functioning of, of democratic societies. And so I think I think we're have a, have a sort of tough hill to climb here to address it in various co international contexts around the world. All right, well, Skip, let's go to you. So in the Cold War, we had a playbook for countering disinformation, but disinformation came from you know states, came from state controlled media. Now, the new way it works is it's really any individual who's able to manipulate hashtags, right? I can I can go on, see what's trending on Twitter. I can start a disinformation campaign or I can start my own trend on Twitter if I've got enough people on a Discord server. So how do we adjust our playbook to deal with this new reality? That's a great question, Nick. And I, I wanna play off a couple of things I heard from Clara and from, from Kevin. You know, first off, uh, I think that the, the, first more, the first thing that's needed is that there's a, a recognition of the potential threat of the negative impact that uh, you know, disinformation can have, is having, has had, uh, and, and real life changes that have resulted from you know, disinformation or use of disinformation by private and uh, government actors, et cetera. So um, from, from NATO point of view, what they've done over the last couple of years is they've refined a number of tools. In fact, they've established what they call a, new, uh, a NATO toolbox. And it's really about actions and mindset. So the mindset that disinformation is something you can't left you know, leave unchallenged, you've got to react to. Uh, and of course, you can, you know, you can uh, calibrate that reaction based on uh, the reach of that, in, of that uh, influence, negative influence, and also the potential impact. But more importantly, it's the, the actions. You have to be, you know, aware and understand. So you have to have a, a system of awareness to monitor, to analyze uh, the, uh, the disinformation, you know, what kind of um, uh, target audiences are, are they trying to, to reach, what are their messages, what are their objectives, what kinds of tools, methods are they using, uh, et cetera. And then uh, you have to be able to understand, okay, uh, what's the potential you know, uh, uh, outcome of, of that disinformation? Is it temporary or is it something that could be lasting? You know, much disinformation is much like a, it's like a, disease, a disease, excuse me, left uh, untreated, it spreads and grows roots uh, and more, is more and more difficult to eradicate, et cetera. So uh, awareness and, uh, and understanding first. Second is engagement. You, you know, this is back to some level of, of action. Now, in some cases, uh, silence may be the appropriate tool, you know, not to uh, you know, give a particular disinformation a greater platform, greater reach than it already may have. So you know, that's, that's something for uh, both organizations and, and governments to, to, to analyze and assess. But more, more often, uh, you know, it's about debunking the information, you know, exposing this false, uh, exposing sometimes the methods, either, you know, uh, attributing them or not, depending on how much you want to, uh, you know, cost you want to impose and perhaps other types of costs you can impose uh, as well. So uh, it's, it's coming up with a, a, a kind of a sliding spectrum of potential uh, tools of engagement. Uh, more importantly, to proactively put out the message you want out there as the dominant one, uh, the factual, you know, truthful information uh, that you want to spread, ensuring that you've got the right kinds of credible, uh, transparent, um, you know, sources uh, with the right kinds of reach, and that uh, you can you can get to the audiences. One and that and that, uh, like uh, Kevin said, whole of society. You've got to partner with the, uh, um, you know, with the civil society for outing, you know, the uh, uh, the disinformers. You know, like Claire was saying, uh, and and using those interested in civil society or just other kinds of uh, you know scouts, information scouts that will help you root out uh, the the right uh, the, the the those who are falsifying information. But uh, um, and also building capacity, you know, media literacy, 
uh, in school or in just in general for the public, uh, for all ages, all age groups, uh, helping them, uh, uh, you know, helping independent media, uh, you know, get their message out, uh, perhaps in some types, you know, building capacity, uh, providing skill, educations and training, let's say for, uh, for journalists and for other types of analysts. Uh, and then, you know, that's a partnering of the whole society. And then not forgetting that, uh, you know, uh, as Kevin's uh, group focuses on geopolitics, uh, that most of this information uh, it addresses more than a single country, it addresses regions. And therefore it's very important to work with, uh, um, you know, other societies, other governments and institutions uh, to address the particular type of, uh, uh, of disinformation. In the, in the Alliance, there was a constant coordination in the council about responding to specific challenges from Russia and China during the COVID crisis, uh, from which actually the, the toolbox was developed as a specific um, you know, aid for policymakers, communicators, et cetera. And so uh, I think that's, that's a part of the, the, the coordination aspect. Okay, is then once you know you have this information, do you share it, uh, you know, the misinformation on a regular basis, uh, the, you know, the, the evidence, uh, the types of methods, the disinform disinformers, uh, with uh, other uh, members of society and then with other, uh, other organizations and uh, uh, other countries, uh, do you sh have a coordinated response? And that was frequently the case when I, when I just cited uh, uh, instances of Russia and China in both COVID and in other issues that had to do with the foreign policy, often with nuclear issues. So I'll stop there, but uh, I think the, the key is that uh, you've got to organize and you've got to come up with a, uh, a plan and a network of, 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 uh, of folks and, and groups that you can work with to uh, fight this information. Right, well, let's let's follow up on that. And either Kevin or Claire, you can take us. I'm curious, you know, following up on what Skip just said, what the lessons are for my uh, institution or for my you know, business, the media. We clearly learned the last five years that there's a common mistake we make in media, which is to identify some sort of titillating, noxious bit of information being shared by three people on Reddit to write a big story about it, and then to make sure that millions of people know about this ridiculous thing that only four people would have known about on Reddit without the useful help of the New York Times. So what is it that media is still getting wrong now that we've kind of learned that lesson? And what are we going to get wrong in the next five years? I can kick off. I think one of the biggest concerns actually in the, uh, the 2018 the midterms that I had worked on, and this is when I was still in US government at the time, and then going into 2020 was there was an overemphasis of the threat of Russia backed or, you know, say state actors that were um, being pushed. And the, the downside is if the media over covers the issue over um, covers the threat, then most people might not actually even decide to participate and vote because they feel like there's nothing they can do um, that there will be bad actors that will continue to manipulate the election. So why does it matter to vote? Which is actually Russia's entire game the whole time was to create so much discord in the US um, that people lose faith in the system itself. And I think that is something that the media needs to be careful about because some people do want to believe that certain threats are bigger than others. It's it's hard for someone to look at a headline and not necessarily just get an impression if it says, you know, Russia backed actors are doing X, Y, or Z. It might be a small campaign targeting a small group of actors, but people may not necessarily read all the details. And so that is something that, you know, you know, Twitter pushed out a feature and a number of other platforms to make sure people read before they share certain articles. Um, I think the media also definitely, uh, I think panels like this are fantastic because sometimes the media will reach whoever is loudest on Twitter or whoever is doing talking the most about an issue, um, which is not a bad thing, but sometimes uh, they may go to the wrong experts. So a few years ago, when a number of cybersecurity companies were starting off in understanding uh, how to even spot uh, stay back disinformation online, they started to get into the sport of it. And a lot of them didn't actually have great tactics for open source intelligence. They were just, you know, chopping along and putting out these reports. And they did come from big names like Symantec. Um, most experts who are looking at this issue from an analysis standpoint um, definitely felt like some of these uh, companies were not necessarily covering these issues accurately. But to someone who's a reporter, that source actually looks pretty credible. And so I think it's it's so important as well for most journalists and um, media outlets covering this topic to be able to have you know, their, their, their set of different experts that they go to to really understand 
where sources of truth could be, um, because it's so easy today, especially in emerging technology issues, for someone to claim they're an expert and then to to get things highlighted where you know it might be distorted or it might overemphasize the truth. And I think that's always a hard balance because so much of the media's responsibility is also highlighting so many issues that are so so important. So I would just try chime in there. Um... I think it was 1997, I listened to Tom Brokaw, the longtime anchor of NBC Nightly News, give a speech about the internet. Uh, he was being awarded an honorary degree at my university, and I was a very keen undergraduate, went to listen to him. And in his speech, he was talking about the way that the web was going to change everything about the information environment, uh, how we'd have all this, this moving from a kind of carefully managed trickle to a flood of information. And I asked him at the reception afterwards, who, who does he think would be the gatekeepers of, of, of this flood of information to help people distinguish the good information from the bad? And he kind of incredulously looked at me and just said, well, journalists. And um, I think that the we're still living kind of, I, th I think we're entering a new phase in the news media. I have great affection for the news media as a journalist for many years before I got into geopolitics. Um, but I think that that kind of incredulity at the, the sort of erosion of, of journalism as the sort of real arbiter of what's, what's real and what isn't is something that the industry is still reckoning with. And I think that, th that it's going to require over the long term rethinking the way that, that news media positions itself as an explainer in society. And some people have been doing really interesting work on this. Uh, Jay Rosen's a media critic at NYU who I think has interesting thoughts about different ways that the media can cover uh, politicians maybe who are trafficking in disinformation um, for political reasons. Uh, ways that even within the structure of a, a news article, you can, you can create ways that you talk about the lie and you talk about the facts as the journalist has uncovered them. Uh, changes like that I think are very important. And I think, uh, Clara, what you said, the importance of finding, I think, rethinking the pundit economy, uh, particularly on pl in places like cable news, because I think that you know, cable news is another very important part of this ecosystem. Uh, and I think that there are some incentives, you know, just like when social media companies optimize for engagement, it creates negative consequences, negative externalities. I think that that optimizing for sort of uh, pundits who say flashy things on TV is also creating negative externalities that, that a little bit smarter programming uh, could help to address, you know, producers making some better decisions about who to really bring on these these kind of tough discussions about complex topics uh, would would go a long way there. So I'll, I'll pause. I see that Skip wants to jump in. Yeah, if I think of a good popular question, I think you're you're, you're muted, but uh, oh, I was going to say jump in quickly on this Skip, and then I'm going to ask you Susan's question. So fire away. Gotcha. Okay, so uh, so real quickly, a couple of things just from personal experience being on the on the other end of a, a microphone, not the one uh, you know. Uh, the, the journalist, but the speaker, so to speak, the operator in the field uh, on many occasions. But what I, uh, a couple of things that have bothered me, both uh, from policy point of view as an operator over, over time, is, is frankly the, uh, what is often seen as a, a very um, key characteristic of the journalist profession, that is to get all sides of the story. Uh, but uh, you know, with the, uh, I think, the proliferation of disinformation over the last couple of decades, uh, and the ability to uh, really have quite, uh, you know, um, fantastic uh, fakes from videos, documents, or whatever it might be, uh, we've gotten to a point where we still sometimes treat uh, all sides as of equal importance without, uh, you know, recognizing that there's an illeg Ill illegitimate side if it happens to be false information. I think that's that's key. There are some journalists and and uh, and uh, could be uh, print, it could be uh, broadcast that focus on uh, ensuring that things are uh, facts are checked, et cetera. But often, as they're going around, um, they're not challenging a specific specific speaker or a specific uh, news source uh, at the moment when it could be clearly challenged with a few simple, you know, structured questions. And so that's one. The other is that, uh, um, that we still have a lot of very biased media. Uh, you know, many of the nation's uh, you know, uh, channels, national channels are very clearly, you know, left, right, uh, very few centric and very few broad. Uh, and uh, that's still an issue. And uh, unfortunately, allowing disinformation through even through a political bias, let alone human bias, uh, you know, to, to persist, I think undermines the cred credibility of that particular, uh, you know, uh, network. And that's uh, not necessarily seen by the networks. They want to maintain their base, whichever side that may be. Absolutely. All right. Let's go to, we have a question from Susan, which overlaps with a question from Ivar uh, Lipnix, the deputy representative of Latvia in the UN. 
And the question is, how important is international cooperation here? And Susan asked particularly, how important should the, how much should the US and allies work with adversaries like China and Russia? So cooperation in general within the United Nations and cooperation with adversaries. Uh, Clara, you've recently worked in the US government. You wanna tell us what your answer is here on? Yeah, I think international cooperation is so important. I, I did wanna emphasize in the US, unfortunately, or fortunately, we, we have all the major social media companies in our backyard. I know China has a few companies that uh, they, they obviously um, like TikTok, for example, but it is it is so important for international cooperation because uh, there, are, there are so many issues. When I was in US government, I had you know heads of um, certain governments or their election security team asking me, hey, can you tell the people at Facebook that this campaign is interrupting our elections and nobody and we have no idea who to turn to at facebook to to reach them and they would send me excel spreadsheets of these accounts and um you know i, I think that's that's one thing that to recognize is there's there's us there's us in western nations and there's countries all around the world that deal with this issue that don't have necessarily direct points of contact and it's so important for the us and so many other countries that have that ability um, to, to lead the way in um, working um, with major social media companies to really tackle some issues. And one thing I did want to emphasize is people who work at these companies, you know, early on, they were expected to know everything. I mean, you have people that spend their life uh, determining acceptable content behavior on these platforms, but how are they a COVID disinformation expert? How do they know about diplomacy? How do they know about geopolitics? It's enormous pressure when there's advocacy on it, but it's another to say, how do we also train people in all kinds of roles, the best way to communicate with each other? And I, I think that's the importance of ensuring that the US, its allies, all the partners, um, we can we can all do that as, as a shared community. And um, social media is also uh, difficult because there are certain policies that are really well enforced in English speaking countries. But when we talk about, you know, when I was working on Myanmar in 2014, uh, that was one of the most diverse countries Facebook determined the language that people speak online there, right? And um, they had nobody working in trust and safety or content moderation uh, dealing with who's a journalist, who is not. And um, this really does um, take alliances and a number of partnerships between a set of countries to really help uh, learn and figure out what we can do at the policy level. Um, there's also so many things that that governments can learn from, from what's happening in disinformation. So for example, if there's a huge anti-vax movement, that definitely impacts a lot of national and uh, national health policies in so many countries, right? So it's two ways, but if, if heads of governments are not paying attention and they are in their own bubble of figuring out emergency response at the local level, they won't really know where the sentiment is. And a lot of these policies, well and good intent may not actually be able to be enforced. So I think it's, so important again um, for for partnerships um, and also for recognition that you know it might hit you know the U.S. then the U.K. which is exactly what happened right. Um, it's so much so important that you know every single country that is an ally um, can can learn from the best lessons from the past. So hard enough to deal with U.S. tech companies. What about dealing with the Chinese government? Uh, Kevin or Skip, do you want to address how uh, how to deal with them? Um, my, my two cents on this, I, I think when, when dealing with disinformation and foreign governments, it tends to be wrapped into a bigger discussion about malicious cyber activity. Uh, and I'm personally just a little bit skeptical that there's, there's a real path towards getting an, a country like Russia or China to, to decide to not make use of that, that capability, especially on the disinformation side, it really occupies this gray area uh, similar to many types of malicious cyber activity that's that's short of of outright aggression it's short of of anything that could be considered a kind of act of war um, it exists in this gray zone um, that, that's kind of unique to to malicious cyber activity and i'm i'm personally just skeptical that that's a route that's going to really be able to solve the problem in anything close to the near term i think it would make more sense as a policy response to accept you know, while continuing to put diplomatic and other types of pressure on these bad actors, uh, sanctions, um, attributions, naming and shaming, uh, in some cases, the U.S. has announced court cases, uh, legal charges against against disinformation merchants uh, that are backed by by states like Russia and China. Um, 
uh, obviously one of the strategies would be to, to keep up that kind of pressure, but I really think that the the real solution, the real more promising area for progress is to focus on uh, within at home, within countries and within groups of like-minded countries on, on ways to try to shore up uh, the information environment. And sorry, Skip, go ahead. No, I didn't want to interrupt you, uh, Kevin, because you were on a roll there. So I think you, you have a good, a good summary of the kinds of the things that uh, I know that uh, NATO talks about and, uh, um, and, and allies with the U.S. have talked about in terms of how to, how to react or work with, let's say, with, uh, with Russia and China. In other words, basically explain to them that uh, this disinformation uh, you know, is being challenged. It's, it's, uh, they understand the, the source uh, and they understand the intent, and it's not going to go uh, you know, unchallenged, so to speak. But I think the only thing I would add is the fact that it's extremely important to the coordinate the response. Uh, we've seen, and we've seen specifically, you know, uh, Xi and, and, uh, and Putin both um, take note of concerted action, coordinated action by the allies, all heads of state or government or ambassadors, you know, all speaking with one voice, sending a similar document uh, where they demonstrate, you know, a consensus on a particular uh, response uh, to a challenge. And I think that's, that's important. That, uh, you know, makes them realize, okay, uh, they're not going to get away with that with, by trying to divide the alliance on one one issue or another. But uh, mm -hmm. it's recognized, it's coordinated within the information is shared by an ally or or, or, or more, and then uh, they get a response that's uh, collective versus individual. This leads very nicely into a question we have here from Jill Doherty. Some have argued that we can use nuclear arms control agreements as a template for some sort of international agreement on cyber, especially Russia U.S. Is that possible? Is the nuclear realm really applicable to cyber? Someone. Okay, I'll Kevin, start. Uh, definitely yeah. not the expert in in in, in, uh, in, in information deterrence, but uh, in terms of uh, um, you know recognizing that that uh, disinformation is a tool, or I should say, can be used by a number of different types of tools that are very sophisticated at the state, at the, at the national level, uh, and agreeing you know between Russia, uh, China, uh, you know U.S. or other major major actors that uh, there are certain uh, I wouldn't call them red lines so to speak. But there are certain sensitivities uh, that uh, you know should not be um, uh, attacked or targeted by disinformation. You know, it could be elections, it could be whatever it might be uh, that uh, people think are extremely important to maintain. You know, uh, either regime control in authoritarian governments or democracy and de de democratically minded uh, uh, societies. And I think that that's that's worth a discussion. So I think there could be some principles. Um, and uh, there could be, you know, the uh, uh, the kinds of uh, um, negotiations or information channels that uh, open up uh, as soon as there are, you know, recognized, uh, you know, uh, disinformation of a particularly sensitive nature, nature that can explain to the, the nation that may be either uh, conducting the action or maybe allowing it, you know, from their own uh, internal society uh, to take note and then stop it so that it doesn't. Uh, you know, escalate, so to speak. So I think there's there's some use uh, usefulness to a a, a nuclear type tree or arms control type tree uh, approach. All right, you want to jump in here? Yeah, no, absolutely. So one thing that is really difficult with the, the word disinformation is it covers every single topic you can imagine. And as many of, of you know in this room, uh, every single government is organized in a million ways. And to coordinate under an information stream is incredibly difficult. Who to pull in the room, when to pull it in, when something is high priority. And so when I was in the U.S. government, this is absolutely something we were discussing among you know Five Eyes or NATO or uh, whatever channel on how we can securely communicate in real time um, to really have a, a message that is credible, depending on who is who is credible. And I worked under both Obama and Trump administration. So, you know, the, there was a lot of um, deep trust or mistrust, depending on who you're talking to, right, in, in, in terms of the public and what they see from the outside. But I, I do want to emphasize that partnerships with uh, with tech companies uh, and the private sector is, is so important here because um, the, diff the different part that is changing in the online landscape is also an incentive problem one, right? So uh, I don't know if many of you here were aware of the Macedonian teenager situation that took place where um, you know, there were kids in Macedonia who were amplifying a lot of content because they would be able to make money from creating really polarizing content. And um, there are so many instances of this where 
if we don't solve the incentive problem that's causing the issue at the first place, uh, it doesn't matter what policies governments do. Um, there will always be people that that want to play the game of either making money or um, being able to rise in popularity to ultimately make money, right? Um, all of this comes down to incentives. And today's internet um, in a very centralized model um, has led a lot of large companies, depending on advertising, uh, to usually mine their user data and um, to really curate an experience that creates a lot of polarization. And so uh, that unfortunately is something that is really hard to solve. You know, cyber warfare is something that is so important for governments, but there's no borders to the internet, right? And, and so if I wanted to log in um, in an IP address from another country, it's really hard for those policies to actually be enforced. I can say I'm in Russia right now today, or, you know, there are a lot of Russian actors that said they were, you know, in London or the US and to be able to determine what is the acceptable policy and for companies on the flip side to say, we're going to, you know, just stop all IP addresses from, from Russia coming in. That's not a great solution either because bad actors, if they have the incentive to act, they will find a way around it. Let me ask, I want to ask you guys about breaking news because um, I don't know, maybe an hour ago, I saw that Jack Dorsey is going to step down as CEO of Twitter. So there's going to be an opportunity to run a company that has promulgated, incentivized, to some way, degree, combated disinformation in an extremely important way. So all three of you are candidates for this job. What would you do if you got it? Who wants to take that one? I, I think that there's a really important part of addressing the disinformation problem that hasn't really been fully addressed. And I think that that's, that's governance. Uh, of internet platforms. And I'm not just talking about governments imposing governance on them. I'm also not just talking about companies deciding to have some kind of framework for governance. I think that one of the problems we have, which interestingly was highlighted by the outgoing chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, after Trump was deplatformed uh, following the January 6th riot. It was Angela Merkel who said, that's very problematic uh, to have the leader of a democratic country uh, who's had his megaphone, his platform for engaging with the public taken away by private companies uh, based on that own private company's individual decision. And so I, if I were running a major social media platform, one of the things that I would start to explore is how could the industry build on what it's done so far, which to me seems very ad hoc, very platform specific. Um, you know, we have, for example, the Oversight Board, which is this kind of quasi-Supreme Court, which is set up by Facebook. Um, what we need is more of an industry solution. And I think about analogs in, in other industries. In the UK, uh, the press is largely self-regulating through a series of norms and standards that, that media companies generally agree to and use to police the most egregious examples of people falling outside of those norms. In the US, the legal profession polices itself through bar associations some of which are, are given in, uh, a sort of imprimatur uh, by governments in, in states where there are mandatory bar associations where you have to be a member of the bar in good standing to, to represent someone in court or, or, or approach the bench. Um, I think that thinking about governance structures that are not just imposed by governments on companies, which is problematic for a whole series of reasons, if you get a more authoritarian government in, in power somewhere, uh, and, and government structures that are just imposed by individual companies or CEOs, which are also problematic from a democratic perspective. There must be some scope to have a, a hybrid of those two, a kind of industry uh, and, and public partnership around, around the governance and decisions about whose accounts stay up and whose accounts get taken down, whose web hosting services get revoked, or whose payment platforms are, are, are taken away when they act outside of clear norms uh, of behavior that we'd expect of, of or both ordinary citizens or top leaders in a democratic society. So I think that that is a, a place where com both companies and governments and civil society should be investing some time and energy to try to figure out if there's a way to get uh, better governance you know, by consensus among, among the key industry players who are so important. Okay, so public-private partnerships, Kevin, but in the US, right? So there's some partnership between Twitter and the US government. Do they have to have that same kind of partnership with the government of Myanmar? Yeah, I mean, interesting question. I, I think that one of the trends we're seeing, not just in uh, social media, but, but across the technology space at the moment, is this idea of uh, countries that are like-minded in the sense of sharing certain democratic values, looking for ways to cooperate together. 
uh, as a way of creating a more effective counterweight to, to more authoritarian countries. This is across a host of technology issues. And we think it's one of the most important issues for the next five or 10 years of the technology sector globally is where this trend goes. Do we get massive fragmentation where nothing's really coordinated? Uh, do we get, do we get like-minded countries that, that share some under, underpinning values uh, working together perhaps with the private sector to create a more appealing alternative to the more authoritarian approach? I, I think that I'd be interested to see where that, how that kind of bigger trend could, could play out on questions like that. All right, Skip, is Kevin right? And if you were interviewed to be CEO of Twitter on this question, what would you do? Well, I don't think that would ever happen, but for the sake of, uh, of, uh, of imagination, uh, I would say that first off, I, I like very much what, uh, um, what Kevin was saying. First off, that I think that the, there needs to be an establishment of norms and principles that uh, uh, industry will sign up to, uh, that will, you know, frankly, uh, address some of the concerns that government has, that civil society has. I think it, needs, I think it requires a, a real collaboration between private and public, and that private's got to include uh, civil society, not just industry, maybe even you know academia as well. It's where research is, is quite important in terms of internet access. But uh, uh, more importantly, I think there's there it, it's it behooves the uh, each one of these major companies uh, to to achieve some type of level of respect and credibility uh, that uh, that they can only achieve uh, if in fact that they they focus on you know, factual information and things that are acceptable in terms of you know the positive influence versus negative influence. And negative influence can be um, you know, read in different ways, but it's usually in terms of things that are destructive, uh, counterproductive, that, uh, that you know, either defame or, uh, or disinform, uh, not that you know, go against a particular policy, so to speak, uh, for, for, for valid reasons. But uh, that said, I think that uh, it's, it's worthwhile uh, coming up with a way uh, of engaging with government, with civil society, to build the kinds of, uh, you know, policies internal uh, to ensure that the uh, people have a free access to the platform to share you know, information, to group, to associate, to do whatever, uh, and focus on things that are important, but at the same time, not spread false information and not defame, you know, without, uh, without, without purpose or reason, I should say. So um, I think that's one thing that uh, if, if I were to ever be uh, the next, uh, you know, Jack Dorsey or, or Mark Zuckerberg, you know, I would uh, I would focus on trying because I think that would build credibility and uh, um, and support uh, for the uh, association for the uh, the company as much as anything. Clara, now it's your turn to uh, in an interview with the board of uh, the board of Twitter. You're up for the CEO job, is what Kevin and Skip just said appropriate. And what else do you do to stop the problem of disinformation? Yeah, I'm so glad that Kevin brought up his point because this is a lot of the work that we've been trying to do at the Trust and Safety Professional Association, Association and the Trust and Safety Foundation. We actually use the Bar um, Association example to say um, for many years, people who work in trust and safety that term in acceptable content on um, major platforms, right, they don't know how to talk about their jobs around the Thanksgiving table. People ask what they do. People think they you know, they look at dick pics every day or they do some degree of content moderation. But today, people working in trust and safety can be account executives that suddenly have to determine whether an account is coming from Russia when there's advertising, right? There's people who are engineers that are trying to build the latest detection tool because if you don't take down content immediately, suddenly something spreads very quickly or copies quickly get made. Um, I think there's a lot that we can actually learn from more black and white categories um, like uh, child pornography online and CSAM, there's bad lessons learned in policy there, but there's also good ones. For example, in the US, the NICMIC is the main coordination place where um, US government shares content with a number of companies to quickly take down child content. Uh, there's a tool called Photo DNA that was originally created to detect child pornography online. And it was used again in terrorist content takedown where that same technology, there's now a hash sharing database that's used by major social media platforms to share with each other that also come with a lot of coordination with governments through the GIFCT, the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism that um, is run by Nick Rasmussen, um, who was formerly from NCTC. And so uh, there are a lot of examples of this already happening, um, but I, I think the difficult part is just getting black and white. We forget that we are in a, we are in a country um, with a lot of privilege for free speech and people want free speech 
Uh, but unfortunately, social media there is also unlimited reach. And so um, I think that's one really hard problem that is at the forefront of this debate, right? People want increased policy, but they also want increased actions against disinformation. You can't actually do content moderation or disinformation well if you don't have enough evidence, right? People will suddenly say, I'm being censored if there's not enough clear explanation. And this was a big struggle by a number of companies, especially with Russian influence operations, where it was really hard to prove the source of the actor. If a content gets taken down that someone's amplifying <laughs> that they don't know came from the Russian IRA, and a social media platform suddenly decides to take down that content because they don't want that to spread, a user might actually think, you know, there might be a political angle, very left, very right, as opposed to something that was, was very much um, around really protecting um, information sources. And so that's, um, that's really, really difficult of a challenge that we have to grapple with in our society is when, when does public safety become um, so forefront that we want to compromise free speech um, as a value. And this is why a number of countries around the world they some of them have chosen to buckle down more, you know, in, in Germany, um, they had um, a policy uh, that really tried to tackle hate speech that went disastrously because politicians found themselves censored with it. Um, and then there were also so many other examples. Um, so it is it is so tough. But um, I think as as Kevin and Skip uh, alluded to, we definitely need more transparent means of, of solving this problem. We definitely need more information sharing between NATO, between companies alike, um, between experts in the public, right? The entire uh, community um, over the last few years that I've been part of um, that do open source research, uh, most people forget that most reporting actually come from users today on the internet. We all do our part. We report something that we don't see and that does get escalated to appropriate teams. We we call out when journalists aren't necessarily reporting with integrity. And so there is also so much for each and every one of you guys in the audience today to just do in your everyday actions um, to really say what you find is the acceptable culture we want on the internet today. Yeah, I think that's a, a wonderful point. It's on solving this problem is on all of us. Um, we have a question from the audience from Beth Ring. When Russia, China, North Korea, et cetera, deny that they had any responsibility for the cyber attacks on energy and other companies and refuse to control those in their territories who were the actors, how can there be any concept of international agreements? Isn't the only way to control this the threat of retaliation? For example, knock out their power. Skip? Okay, I would say that's the only way to respond. I think that uh, this is this goes back to you know analyzing the potential impact or the impact of something that's occurred, uh, and then you know figuring out exactly what's the appropriate response response to deter uh, that particular state or the particular actors you know that were involved. So in the case of the you know cyber attacks against the uh, um, uh, against the, the fuel system you know in the eastern United States, I think the appropriate action was to go back and expose the uh, both the uh, you know the methods, uh, the uh, the actors, you know, to Russia, um, try to first attempt to get the Russian government to act, and if not, then move, move out with other international you know um, authorities, uh, which is exactly what I think the U.S. did. So in that in that case, I would I applaud the the response for the administration because I think you have to one, you've got to confront uh, the uh, the state that's either the actor or hosting the actors, uh, and then attempt ide ideally to get that person or that state, excuse me. Uh, to to take the action necessary to uh, um, either you know investigate uh, to uh, to pursue or whatever uh, the, the the folks are involved in, in malicious uh, cyber activity, uh, but more importantly, I think that even get to the point that uh, that the administration did was the required information intelligence sharing that was necessary to reach out to the companies that were attacked, to get them to feel comfortable enough to share the, the detailed information of the intrusions that occurred. Uh, and this kind of whole of society approach uh, is only possible if you know, private, private, private sector, civil society trusts government to you know, use that information uh, for the appropriate uh, you know, uh, action or intent. And so I think it's, it's very, very important that the, uh, the government's create that kind of an atmosphere for information sharing and that it, 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 it continues um, you know, uh, uh, as, as we go forward and that uh, they can, you know, the, all the private sector can be uh, scouts along with government uh, of malicious activity, report it and figure out how best to defend, what tools worked, what didn't, what uh, you know, weaknesses in the defense uh, exist and how to then you know, um, uh, provide the right kind of bulwark response to 
defend from future uh, you know, malicious activity, and then also respond against the, the, the bad actors. Uh, Kevin or Claire, you want to jump in quickly? We have uh, about two to three minutes left. You can give a quick comment here. Um, in 2015, there was obviously a huge power grid at cyber attack in Ukraine <laughs> related to elections. And I think the other flip side is today, um, I joined US government a few years ago um, through a program that brought entrepreneurs and technologists to do a term of service. And I think one thing that's shocking for most people seeing inside all governments is just a lack of really smart talent um, that comes from the technology sector because most public service opportunities pay so much less and it's really hard for a lot of people the smartest software engineer at a very large company to take to quit their job and get one fourth of the salary right but a lot of these also come from vulnerabilities that just come from a talent pipeline um how we can secure our energy grid system in a way that um that doesn't allow for these things to happen in the first place because these vulnerabilities come when governments don't know how to necessarily protect at the first front. And so um, that's one more point that I'll add. Kevin? I just had a couple of quick closing thoughts. Um, first, I think that diplomacy is one tool, uh, but the, arguably the, the disinformation economy is the bigger problem uh, than getting other countries to agree diplomatically not to do it. Another avenue that you can pursue is to try to either undermine the disinformation economy, which I think we're starting to see, including among some of the platform companies at, at, at looking at deplatforming or, or limiting certain types of advertising, um, but also potentially creating a counter disinformation economy. And you see this with ransomware as well. You have bug bounty programs, you have um, US security services and FBI seizing ransom payments. Uh, you have sanctions against bad actors. Addressing that sort of underlying economy uh, is, is also really important here. And the final thought I'd give is I think there's a big opportunity here uh, for corporations in the United States and other countries, not just the technology companies, but other companies that advertise on these platforms uh, to speak up and put political pressure around the disinformation issue. There's a trust barometer, which is published by Edelman, this PR consultancy. It's been published for 20 years. And it shows across the board over two decades declining trust in institutions uh, in the United States. But the one institutions that now are seen as some of the most reliable purveyors of information are actually companies. Um, it may seem strange, but, but compared with governments and, and uh, social media platforms kind of rank very low as well. But other corporations do have power, I think, in this environment to speak up and demand uh, closer collaboration, more aggressive approaches to countering disinformation, because ultimately, uh, in my view, personal view, disinformation is bad for a market economy. You, you not only need a democracy having good information, in, information flows to function, uh, but for a, a market-driven economy to function, ultimately longer term, you need reliable information. And so I think that companies do have a role here in speaking up. That is an excellent point to end on. I'll add that this panel has been full of good, good information. So I thank you all and I thank everyone in the audience for providing positive information. I want to hand it back over to our host, Susan, who will give us the best information. Susan? Of course, the best information is um, if you want to see more programming like this, please uh, consider joining the National Committee on American Foreign Policy as a member, because I think um, this is one of the things that we want to look at is how can, um, and I think Kevin put it very well in his uh, closing comments, you know, how can governments, uh, multilateral organizations uh, like NATO and the UN work together to counter this problem while um, while ensuring that we have freedom of speech and we uphold democratic values. So I wanna thank all of you for participating today and I hope that you'll join us next um, um, uh, Monday where we will look at this from the other side of the Atlantic and get perspective from European um, colleagues and friends. So thanks again for joining us and thanks again to Skip, Nick, Clara, and uh, Kevin for providing us with a fantastic discussion. And, um, and Clara's just told me she has a lot more to say. So um, I guess we should have planned this for a longer program, but um, we'll invite you back, Clara, to give us more information. So thanks again. Thank you, everybody.